So he's had quite an accomplished career. And I'm so pleased he's talk, going to talk about his uh, stories of a journey through STEM land as a minority because he has had quite an interesting path. And so I'll turn it over to him and tell you all about it. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I want, want to thank all the organizers for inviting me here to start off with. Uh, it was a rather interesting day yesterday, which I think is just a prelude to I think what will be hopefully a very nice conference. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, I also want to thank Dr. Karen Ullenbeck for her talk because she set the right tone. It's going to be hard for me to follow this, but we'll, we'll see if we can do this as well. Um, let's see. Uh, when I was thinking about this talk, uh, I could have given a normal math talk, uh, and, and I have a lot of those that I could have pulled out of the, uh, the archives, so to speak. Uh, but I really thought that for this audience, we really needed something that was a little bit different. And as I was thinking about it, I thought that really what I wanted to kind of highlight was the not so straight path that one takes from graduate school, or maybe even before graduate school, to a life as a mathematician. Uh, it's a rather convoluted story sometimes, uh, but what I wanna do is I wanna tell you stories rather than give you a lot of equations. Now, this is a math talk, so there will be some equations, don't worry about that. Uh, but we will mostly highlight the stories part of this. All right, so let me get started. And like all good stories, let's we'll start at the beginning. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank and I wanna dedicate this talk to my, my daughter, Rachel. And my son, Jeremy, I used to coach both of them in soccer, spent a lot of time uh, talking to them about what it takes to be successful in life and not just as soccer players, but it's also in, uh, um, uh, in, in professional life. Uh, my daughter here, uh, it, both of them are actually very young here. Uh, they are now, she just got her PhD in physical therapy from the University of Illinois a couple of years ago. And my son, I'm very proud to say, got got a uh, PhD in mathematics from a little known uh, university in California called Berkeley. <laughs> uh, so um, they, I think, are my uh, greatest accomplishments. So I want to dedicate this talk to them. All right. So as I said, let's start the story at the beginning. So I'm going to call act one. There'll be four acts to follow. And I'm going to call this pan comido. Uh, for those of you that don't speak Spanish, that means piece of cake. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I call it pan comido in a minute. All right, a little bit about me, just to get you kind of acquainted. Uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. That's not Houston, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was born in Houston. I say that because uh, there's a lot of people in Texas because once they hear and see me, they always want to know where are you from, and I no, don't know if anybody's gotten that expression before that comment question. Uh, but uh, after my parents moved from Mexico to Houston and we were born, uh, they got a little homesick. They were originally from Mexico, and so we moved back to Mexico. So this is a picture of us uh, where uh, if anybody I don't know if anybody recognizes those are the pyramids of Tenochtitlan. And uh, that's us there. We actually climbed up one of them, not the big one, the little ones. We weren't allowed on the big one because uh, parents, being parents, didn't want us to kind of get hurt. Um, but then a little bit later, we moved back to Texas. So that's me looking very dapper in a corduroy uh, sweater. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can see I was always styling. <laughs> As my daughter used to say, uh, Daddy, where that's the word, did you? <laughs> so, uh, obviously, things have changed a little bit, but that's me in around the fourth to the fifth grade when we had moved back to Texas. All right. A little bit more about me. As uh, Bob has already mentioned, I won the Sockness Distinguished Scientist Award. This is my son, who I think is even prouder <laughs> of that award than I am. Uh, here I am at uh, UC Berkeley in a program called NERDS, which is... I'm always going to forget this. New experiences in research and development for students, I think. Anyhow, they, 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 they basically took the word nerds and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to own that <laughs> to, to, to do things that, that we think are really helpful. So it's a, it's a learning community at Berkeley, one of the better ones that I've seen, uh, run by Diana Lasaragia. And uh, so I was honored to give them a talk there as well. And then here, uh, I took a bunch of students to SACNAS conference, which I uh, was mentioning, the Society for uh, Chicanos and Hispanics, Native Americans and Sciences. So that's all of us out there at the uh, uh, SACNAS conference. 
uh, where the uh, president, these two folks here were the president and vice president of the Sockness student chapter, which we started, I helped start at uh, UC Merced when I first got there. And in its second year, it won the student chapter of the year award. So I was also very proud. I just, I love, I love the faces that they're just, uh, they were very, very happy to be there uh, and very happy to have won the award. All right. But on the more fun side, I do like to go out with my kids, as I said. We're here we are skiing. This is Yosemite, not too far away from Merced. So it's a nice, easy one. And this one I just put up to uh, because we uh, just finished doing a 10K run. My, that's my daughter there. Now you can see her a little older. And uh, she talked me into doing a 10K run. And we just finished that. She told me it was a hot chocolate run. She neglected to tell the part about the 10K part. <laughs> no, she really, she told me about it. But uh, we finished it up uh, in eight, uh, uh, let's see, January. So that was Sunday. Uh, I came in third in my age group. The three of us got together at the end of the race. And <laughs> no, there were actually about 20 in my, in my age group. So I was actually kind of happy to finish right there. All right. So that tells you a little bit about me. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about what it means to be a mathematician, especially minority mathematicians, minority scientists. Let me just use the generic term scientist here. And what I call the seeds of doubt. Okay. So here are some factors associated with test scores. I got this from Freakonomics, one of the uh, podcasts that I listened to, uh, Levitt and Dubner. Uh, and they claim that there are certain factors that are associated with test scores uh, going into college. So highly educated parents, high socioeconomic status, so on. Okay, so I went through them and I said, okay, or do any of these apply to me? Highly educated parents. Well, my dad didn't finish high school. My mom did, but she didn't go to college. So I'm going to say no to that. High socioeconomic status, not really. Uh, when we were growing up, my dad worked. Uh, lower middle income, maybe, if you want to classify it. So no. Mother over 30 at the time, no. Parents spoke English at home, no Spanish at home. Normal birth weight. Okay, got one better. <laughs> uh, child not adopted? Also not adopted. Parents involved in PTA? No, not really. Uh, as my parents mostly spoke Spanish, that kind of was one of the uh, uh, deterrents to that. Uh, many books at home? No, but I will, a little caveat, my mom used to, uh, one of my fondest memories, my mom would pack up all the kids, five of us. You can think of us as little ducklings following her on the way to the library once a week, she would have one of these shopping carts because each and, each and every one of us would take whatever the limit was that we could take out of the books. <laughs> the librarian would always say, are you really reading all these books? Of course I am. So we had to carry carts and so we did go to the library and get a lot of books, so maybe so. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six no's, two yeses. So how exactly did I get here, right? Well, by almost any predictive measure, and you know, free economics is, is one of them, but there's many other ones, I really shouldn't have finished college, right? Given those factors. Much less gotten a PhD or be a professor at the University of California. And I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what this is in a bit. But by all factors, I shouldn't be standing here in front of you guys. Okay. So what was it? Well, Again, credit where credit is due. This is a picture of my mom. Uh, she passed away a, little, a couple of years ago. But it really started with my parents. I said my mom graduated from high school. She was on her way to becoming an elementary school teacher, <laughs> as was the, the, uh, one of the major uh, professions at that time for, for women. Uh, so, but she didn't go to college, so she never finished that, I, that, that whole thought. But she did instill in us a very very strong sense of education. That was the way, that was the path. That was the key to really being successful. A lot of hard work. I saw my dad really work his heart out to try to give enough money for the kids. Communication skills, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but that's really certainly something that I think we sometimes don't give enough weight to. Yes, the technical skills are important, but I'll tell you after 30 plus years of hiring, Folks at Sandia National Labs, I worked at Exxon as well, Barnes Berkeley Lab, BC Merced, faculty, hires. The communication skills really set the people apart. Okay. Great mentorship. 
Okay, that's important. Then I'm going to say it again. Great mentorship. It's something that we do not take enough advantage of. And I really do hope if I leave you with one message today, we need to work on this. We meaning all of us, the community. Okay? And then, <clears throat> without a doubt, I had some lucky breaks. All right? In fact, I would say probably more than my fair share of lucky breaks. So I can't discount that. But all of these are important. And some, some of the things I'll talk about today and the stories I'll tell you, I hope will kind of emphasize some of these things. Okay? All right. So high school. I went to a school in the east end of Houston. Uh, not one of the best schools in the, in the city. Uh, public school had about 3,500 students. Yeah, about 3,500 students. Graduating class of about 600, 650 people, okay? I mentioned those numbers because the place that I went to after high school, and I, when I finished up high school, I went, and my first lucky break was I went to Rice University. At that time, it had around 2,100 students. <laughs> so I mentioned it because the high school that I went to actually had more students and was obviously a little bit more diverse, not that much more diverse than Rice was at the time. But I was one of only two students that went to Milby. I'm sorry, that went to um, uh, Rice from Milby. Almost everybody else went to UT Austin or Texas A&M. Uh, started in electrical engineering because I really wanted to be a computer scientist. I'll mention why I was wanted to be a computer scientist at, at the in a minute. But they didn't have a computer science degree at that time. Uh, in fact, the only way that you could get any kind of computer science kind of uh, courses was to be in electrical engineering. So what the heck, how much harder can electrical engineering be? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I was soon to find out. Okay, I did eventually switch over to math when I uh, went to graduate school. I got all four of my degrees uh, from Rice, just to, to be upfront. Uh, so a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering along with a master's at the time. And then when I went back to graduate school, I switched into computational math. It was called math sciences at that time, but computational math and my PhD. Okay, so let me pause here for a second and tell you the first of my story. So when I was in high school, I uh, uh, was doing fairly well and I got admitted to Rice. Now Rice, um, don't know how many people know about Rice University. Okay, fair number, okay. Uh, they like to build themselves as the Harvard of the South. <laughs> Maybe it should be the Princeton of the South. I don't know. <laughs> it, uh, it certainly uh, likes to think of itself as, as kind of one of the one of the better schools in the South. Uh, they also claim that they have something like over half of the people are valedictorians or salutatorians in their high school. So they're pretty selective. So I was really proud that I was one of the students selected to go to Rice. So I went to one of my high school teachers, who I really respected, and I said, hey, just wanted to let you know, I got accepted to Rice. And his comment was, well, that's great. You know, not too many of your kind ever succeed. <laughs> so I was like, I just want to respond to that. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of went away, didn't think too much about it. I, I mean, you're a high school senior, here's a professor or a teacher, I should say. Wasn't sure what to make of that, okay? I did get lucky though, and I found myself a summer internship at NASA that summer between high school and going to Rice. All right, so why did I get interested in computer science? Because I had a summer internship at NASA and the job that they had me doing was programming. So I go into NASA and it was, I, I think by and large, one of the best experiences I ever had. But when I got there, I was talking to some of the engineers there Anybody ever seen Hidden Figures? Okay, it didn't change too much uh, in 1974 from the time that uh, we were talking when you saw the movie. So when I get there, uh, I start talking to the engineers and these are all you know, folks that were ancient to me. They were 30, 35. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told them, they started asking questions, where are you gonna go? I'm gonna go to Rice. So they had all gone to A&M or UT. In Texas, that is the thing to do. And they went, ooh, that's a pretty selective score. You know, the dropout rate at AM or UT Austin or whatever is like 40 or 50 percent. So at Rice, this waste is more selective. So probably even higher dropout rate. You're, you're not going to survive. 
And then we started talking a little bit more, and they said, well, well, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I think I, I can do okay. Well, then, and I've lost my Texas accent for the years, so I can't do, do this dress. One of the engineers said, well, I hope you're not going to grow up to be one of them. They're uppity Mexicans. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> How does one respond to that? So once again, you're sitting there kind of going, I don't know what to say. Right? Now, I, I mentioned these stories not for their shock value. I think anybody my age is probably can tell you stories like this, more or less. It's happened to every single one of us. If you're a woman, you mentioned some of your stories. If you're a minority, it was the same thing. Okay. So, but I do want to set the context, the background for what it was like back in those days, what we had to put up with, for lack of a better word. Things have changed now. Or have they? Hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, but here's what I what I call the seeds of doubt cycle. Okay, back in those days, in addition to all of these, there's also the question of well, the only reason you're here, the only reason you got accepted to Rice, the only reason you're at NASA, the only reason is because of anybody want to fill it in for me? Affirmative action, right? The only reason you're here is because you're a special case that made for you. Okay, so in fact, if you look around the room, it turns out that you're the only underrepresented minority in the, in the place. I was certainly the only Mexican American at NASA. When I was at Rice, there were more of us. I think there were five or six of us at the time in that freshman class. So you start to feel that everybody's watching. And I call this the goldfish bowl syndrome. I sort of felt like a goldfish. I was there, I was alone, didn't have a lot of people to talk to. And you sort of feel like you really can't take any chances that might lead to failure. Because if you do, what are they gonna say? Well, we kind of knew that already. You're here because of affirmative action. So we didn't really expect much from you. So whatever. So you really take great care to stay inside your little goldfish bowl. You don't wanna take any chances. You don't wanna do any undue attention on you. Keep your head low, work hard, and we'll see what happens. So that's sort of what the place was like. And by the place, I mean kind of the professional world. All right. So that's where we were at. Let's talk now about the real world. So this is one of my favorite <laughs> sayings. Because we're mathematicians, we like to do theory. And in theory, there really is no difference between theory and practice. But here's what the truth is, in practice there is. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So I got my PhD, as I mentioned at Rice. Uh, and so it was time to step out into the real world. So I jump in ahead a little bit, but you know, bear with me. I started to, well, my first job was at Sandia National Labs, which was in California, not the one in Albuquerque. So I was at the smaller location. But I got in there and I started to take a look at some of the things that I might be able to do. And as a mathematician, one of the things that was very attractive to me, I have now switched from computer science over to math, was the ability to take what you knew and apply it to a whole host of different types of problems. Okay. So I'm an applied and computational mathematician. So I tried to put the two together and I started to work on problems like gray tracing or geophysics problems, molecular conformation problems for drug design, or even what's called the chemical vapor deposition optimization problem. And in each case, these are all optimization problems that we were looking at. Okay. And the first thing I realized was is that all the things I had learned in class, all the optimization theory, all the different kinds of things that I, I, I knew about in terms of mathematics, didn't work. <laughs> and the reason was is because every time we turn around and said, well, okay, let's try to optimize this problem here. Okay, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, which is these, this is a big large furnace, which stands about six or seven feet tall. And you put silicon wafers in a racks. So think of them as a pizza, large pizza oven where you put a bunch of pizzas, in this case, silicon wafers, 
you bake them and you create microelectronics devices. Okay. The problem is that when you do this, is you really need to make sure that the temperature is the same at the top as it is in the bottom, and the same in the middle as it is on the outsides, because you want the entire silicon wafer to have the same temperature distribution. Otherwise, you get failure in the yield rates. So you, you get basically, you have to throw away a bunch of chips. Okay. So you want to optimize, you want to minimize the temperature deviation. Easy to do. Write me a function. Well, we don't have a function, but we have a simulator that can give us the temperatures. Okay. What's the first derivative? Um, no, what's the second? We just take the hash and take the derivative. We'll use Newton's method. Don't have second derivatives. Okay. Um, I can work with that. Give me the first derivatives. We don't have first derivatives. <laughs> okay. So again, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. And practice this is what you get. So that led me down a path of what we are, it's now known as non-differential, well, sorry, uh, derivative free optimization problems, which is the area that I mostly was working on, okay? Same type of problem over here. So I don't have time to talk about all these problems. We can talk about them later if you have questions, but in essence, each and every one of these is an optimization problem where all of the standard theory doesn't quite apply. That doesn't mean you can't, do something with it. The one nice thing about a math degree is it teaches you to try to solve problems in a creative new type of a way. It allows you to do the analysis. It allows you to think of, of other opportunities, other other uh, ways of looking at these types of problems. So let me take a look at one problem in particular, and that's the optimization method we were using for drug design. In this one, we worked with a drug company, and what they were looking at, they were trying to find drugs for HIV. And the idea is basically one that I think I can explain in, 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 without too many equations. You have a molecule. There's a molecule there, all the little green atoms you can see, just like they look in real life. <laughs> and the idea is that if you can place a drug into a particular place in there, you can stop this molecule from doing what it's supposed to do. And if you can stop it from doing what it's supposed to do, you stop the disease, the cancer, whatever it is that you want to do. Okay, so the holy grail is to figure out what that conformation looks like. What's the 3D configuration of that molecule? Then figure out a smaller molecule that you can insert in there to stop it from doing what it's supposed to do. So that's what this guy is supposed to be, okay? The assumption is that this thing wants to be in its lowest energy state. So it's an energy minimization problem. So once you can figure out what the energy of this system is, then you can figure out some confirmation of this that will fit in there that minimizes the energy. Then you know that the drug will go in there and stop the molecule doing what it's supposed to do. So it really is just an optimization problem. It's a really tough optimization problem. We always think, tend to think of, well, let's assume the function is convex. Not really. <laughs> Let's suppose it's got a unique solution. Not really. In fact, you can show that this one has an exponential number of, of minima. So it really becomes then a problem of trying to figure out how to uh, combine the mathematics with the physics and the biology and the chemistry in a way that somehow all works together. And that to me was one of the things that I learned in graduate school and that is to work with other people. Okay. Learn to work with other people and learn to communicate with them in their language, and you can solve a lot of problems together as a team. So that's one of the other um, messages I want to leave you with. All right. So after Sandia, I moved to Berkeley, as Bob said. I had to trade my tie and my suit over for a pair of button socks. Luckily, there's lots of stores in Berkeley where you can get those. And uh, then I really moved into a different kind of an area of math. And that was the move to science applications. So I still worked a little bit on some of the molecular conformation problems, but I also worked on trying to figure out how to make the electric grid more reliable. You guys are probably too young, but in 2003, the Northeast blackout took out basically the entire quadrant over here of New York all the way up to Canada, and I think as far down as Pennsylvania, yeah, Pennsylvania is there, so you can't really see it, right? But it's dark. <coughs> I also worked on nanoscience problems, which allowed us to 
come up with better solutions for solar cell materials, so energy efficiency. Okay, so that was the computing the properties of nanostructures. But once again, the common theme in all of this was is that you can use math to be able to model this and then solve some sort of a problem that might be of interest to other people. All right, so let me pick out again one example as a, a means of showing you kind of the kinds of things you can do with the mathematics. All right, so solar cells are really just, if you think about them at a very, very high level, it's a set of materials here that have electrodes on two sides of them and some glass to protect the solar cell. What happens is sunlight comes in, photons, and they have a certain amount of energy. And when that energy goes through the glass and hits this material, it creates excited at, uh, electrons. Those electrons then gravitate towards the electrodes and that gives you an electric current. So the question that came up was is, are there ways to figure out what this material should be to give you the highest efficiency for a solar cell, okay? It turns out the solar cell, solar energy is very promising technology, but the trouble is, at least at the time that we were looking at it, it costs about 30 cents per kilowatt hour to manufacture or to generate. That compared to say coal, which is about a nickel. All right, so everybody wants to use solar cells, solar energy, but now that is going to cost you six times. All right. So imagine your utility bill, multiply it by six. Nobody's going to want to pay that. So what you want to do is try to figure out if there's a material that will get you something closer to the nickel per kilowatt hour. And the idea here is then to model the material here and to try to figure out which properties of the material give you the highest efficiency. It turns out that to do that, you can use nanorods made out of some, a material called cadmium selenide. It's a semiconductor material. But the way that it was typically done was is you would take some cadmium materials. Let's say you material scientists would take some cadmium, take some selenium, mix it together. And I mean, literally mix it together, make a, make a substrate, put it in there, test it out. Didn't work out what I wanted to. Okay, take some more have a different combination of proportions of cadmium and selenite, mix it up, try it again, measure the efficiency, didn't quite work, let's do it again. All right, you get the picture, right? So our idea was is instead, if we can model this mathematically, let's put it on a computer. And if we can do that, then we don't have to mix it. We don't have to spend six months trying to make the material just to figure out that it wasn't quite what we wanted. Better yet, we can probably figure out what the right proportion is by trying some optimization. All right. So here's one of those materials, those atoms. Again, what we had before, a lot more of them now. In this case, it was 2,600 atoms, quantum rod. We had to end up using about 2,500 processors at NERSC, which is the supercomputing center at Berkeley Lab. Calculation took about 30 hours to do. Had we done this using standard techniques, and I didn't say much about the techniques that we used, but had we used standard techniques, it would have been closer to a couple of months, all right? What we instead did was, it turns out that when you look at this problem here, it is a, what's called a Schrodinger equation. And for those of us who are in mathematics, it turns out to be a kind of a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. All right, so all you have to do, all you have to do to solve a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. <laughs> How hard can that be? <laughs> All right, once again, it turns out that if you do that in a standard way, it will take you the three to four months to do that. What we did instead was is, again, through a combination of talking to the quantum physicists, the material scientists, the chemists even, we came up with a method that's called a linear scaling method. And by linear scaling, it means that instead of going like the typical methods, it used to be into the cube where N was 2633, or the number of atoms that you have, it went, the algorithm was uh, complexity order N. So much, much faster, okay? So again, the advantage of using the mathematics. Okay, there's the equation. So I promised you some equations, there you are. 
I'll give you some time to write them down. Those <laughs> uh, call the cone sham equations, uh, and they are essentially the uh, variation on the Schrodinger equation that I mentioned. Uh, and these all, all the terms in here basically will tell you something about the state of the system, the, those molecules, that I'm, uh, those atoms that I mentioned to you. Uh, and you have to calculate those. That gives you the energy. And then what you do is minimize that energy. Okay. The only tricky part is this term here, which of course looks like the simplest one. No one really knows how to handle that. Uh, that's actually one of the open challenge uh, problems. I, I would think that if somebody can actually come up with a way of handling that better, uh, it would actually um, revolutionize that field. It's called the exchange correlation term, and it has to do with the fact that atoms or electrons, I should say, don't like to be in close. Uh, they have to satisfy certain properties when they're next to each other or close to each other. All right, so I put that up there just as to say, you know, here's the kinds of things you can do. I'm not going to say much more about the mathematics other than what I mentioned, which is that we try to uh, use mathematical techniques to try to address a problem rather than to brute force the method, which I think is one of the uh, things that uh, mathematicians are very, very good at. All right, okay, so act four. So I call this the not so changing landscape or the changing landscape. We can all decide, we can have a discussion. Let's have a discussion afterwards. The changing landscape or maybe not so. Okay, so I took this from an LA Times article now 2014, all right? And the, the headline was California Latino surpass whites in freshman UC admissions offers. So at that time in 2014, Close to 30% of those admitted to at least one UC campus were Latino, compared to 26.8% were white, blacks from California were just 4.2%. So do horribly with African Americans, Latinos had outpaced whites. Okay. And UC Merced, where I'm at, 52.3% of our undergraduate students are Latino, Latina. Okay. So when we passed the 50% mark, that was kind of a landmark for a lot of people. Also, mostly first generation students, somewhere on the order of 62, 64%. I can't remember the last numbers that, that I looked at. Okay, so landscape is changing by a lot, right? What is it? <laughs> let's take a look at some other numbers. Right. Same time, let's take a look at the faculty. So I mentioned this article was 2014. Let's take a look at the faculty at UC campuses. All right. Life sciences, these are percentages. Ooh, although they're not that far off from the real numbers. 1.8, 4 4.4, 80 percent. Life sciences, physical sciences. Let's take a look at math, CS, and engineering. 0. 0.8, 4.8, 2.6. So when you take a look at the faculty, are they representative of demographics of California. Not really, not, not really at all. But you guys are mathematicians, you will say, but that was 2013, right? <laughs> that was 2013. Right. Surely the numbers have changed. We're in 2023, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> all right, I said to you, let's go take a look at the numbers. So the latest numbers uh, are in 2021. So it's hard to read this, so I kind of highlighted the important parts over here. But just to give you a sense, uh, here are the categories, white, Asian, Native, Hawaiian, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, American Indian, Black, African American. Here are the percentages of each one of them. And so you take a look at Latino, Latina, from 2011, it was 3.9%, as I mentioned. 2021, it had grown to an awesome 5.6%, <laughs> okay? African American, 2.1%, 2.7%. Okay. But then let me just highlight for you that's all faculty, not just STEM. So, where are you supposed to the vast majority of those numbers are from? Not STEM. Not STEM. Not STEM. <laughs> Social sciences, humanities. And that's fine. We, we welcome all. all Disciplines, right? It's an open, inclusive crowd. 
So let's, go, let's take a look at the STEM numbers then. Are those tenure lines? Sorry? Those tenure lines? Not a rank faculty. Yep, exactly. I took out the adjunct because they're temporary, but yes, that are right there. So basically academic sense. Okay. Oops. And so let's just pull out just engineering and CS, life sciences, math, and physical sciences. All right. 2.3% in 2011. Again, a whopping 3.4% for 2021. African American 0.6 to 1.1. So, changing landscape? No, awesome. <laughs> now, I have to give it to UC because they're a wonderful press machine. <laughs> <laughs> what they did instead was is they compared themselves to MIT and Princeton and Harvard. <laughs> and guess what? Those numbers look awesome. <laughs> So when you take a look at these numbers, you're not supposed to take a look at them like that. You're supposed to take a look at them. Use a relative metric instead. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so take a look at those numbers and you say to yourself, okay, have things really changed? Not really. Not really. Okay. Now, back in 2013, when I first gave a talk and I used those numbers over there, people said, yes, but we have many programs. We have all sorts of uh, new um, initiatives. We're going to change the landscape. Let me just tell you that if I were giving out grades, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly that that would earn an A or a B. Yeah, C. At least it didn't go backwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, I have to tell a funny story about this because if this happened when I went to Merced and I became the Dean of the School of Natural Sciences, as Bob said. So there was a wonderful press announcement about me becoming the Dean at UC Merced. And so I said, this is, you know, it's wonderful. They're, you know, they're so nice to me. So I said, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna meet all the other deans in the math and the physical sciences areas and in the life sciences. So I went and I did a quick tour of all the campuses on uh, uh, UC. I think I hit all of them except I may have missed UC Santa. No, I did UC Santa Cruz. It's over All right. How many other deans were Latino, Latina in the math of the physical sciences? Zero. <laughs> zero, zero. <laughs> yes. So, in fact, when they announced it, I had changed dramatically the numbers. <laughs> UC Merced. All right, for, for the UC system. I mean, that's, that's an infinite improvement. <laughs> right? So before I left, uh, stepped down as dean, they had appointed a second one at UCLA. So in that case, the numbers went up by 50%. Sadly, when I stepped down, they also went <laughs> by 100%. <laughs> so um, you take your wins where you can, but you know it just shows you the, the fertility of the system. Uh -huh. Can I just ask if you have similar numbers for new hires? Yes, I do. Okay. And in fact, if you go here, there's a dashboard and you can basically pick out exactly what you want on these things. But yes, uh, the numbers are slightly better for new hires. That's okay. They are. That wouldn't be hard. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> the question you want to ask is, how many get tenured? Oh. <laughs> That's the question you want to ask. That's the question you want to ask. Okay. Because in fact, it's easy to hire, well, I said easier to hire, uh, but when it comes to tenure, it becomes a different kind of a, a topic, different story, okay? So did they change? I, I don't know. I, I kind of go back and forth on this. I, I think that it's, it's good that the UC system, it's, it's, it likes to think of itself as the best public university in the world. But if these are the best numbers we can come up with, I'm not so sure that we're doing that good a job. All right. Am I on the record, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm at an age where it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> so here's my, here's my, my comment. Your numbers alone did not translate the scientists or leaders. So even if we had numbers, I think what's important here is to look at who are the scientists and the leaders in particular. That's really because that's what sets the tone. Mm -hmm. 
That's what gets you going from point A to point B. Okay, so the numbers are not significantly different than they were 20 years ago, right? When I first got my PhD at Rice, I got a, I got called into Richard Tapia's office. You guys know Richard Tapia? <laughs> so Richard Tapia was the professor there, very well known in minority uh, uh, events. And he called me into his office. He goes, I just got a call from the National Science Foundation. And he, and he said, they were congratulating us. We had graduated one half of the Latino, Latina PhDs in mathematics for that year. <laughs> Three of us. <laughs> there were six in the country. There were six in the country when I got my degree. Okay. So out of curiosity, I went back and looked at the numbers again for, I think it was three years ago. There, the numbers always lag. Any guesses how many? In the country, PhDs in mathematical sciences, domestic. What year? Uh, I think it was two years ago, the numbers I had. 60. 20? 20, 100, 60. 12. 12. <laughs> it was around 60. So whoever said 60, it was around 60. Okay. So that was from 1986 to 2020, let's say 2021 or something. Again, do the numbers, numbers are good, but do they mean, what do they mean? So my claim is that if we follow the same path we've been following, we're gonna be waiting here for a long, long, long time to see any change. In fact, I've used the term glacial. I think in fact, now I, I'm wrong because glaciers are melting at a much faster pace <laughs> than you are in your answer. So one of the things that I would love to have a discussion with everybody is how, how do we change this? Because we've been doing the same thing for 30, 40 years without a lot of change. And you guys all know the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> right? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We need to change how we do some things. I've got some ideas on how we can do that and, and we'll talk about that, okay? So I'm gonna get into a slightly uncomfortable topic here. Everybody. Hang on to your seats. All right, let's talk about white privilege. <laughs> so I like this article that came out by Nicholas Kristof in Straight Talk 2015. It says that maybe that's because in a race, it's easy not to notice a tailwind, right? If you're running, it's, it's not, you don't notice when the tailwind's there. And white men often go through life with a tailwind, while women and people of color must push against the headwind. Okay, so I kind of like that analogy because in a sense, you don't really feel it when you're getting help. Mm -hmm. But boy, you feel it when you're fighting against the head, not the headman, right? Okay, but I think it's, it's more than that. So let me use that analogy. Let's stretch that analogy a little bit. So not really a tailwind or a headman, but you know, I sometimes feel like that's, that's us trying to run, okay? So everybody else doesn't have this little parachute. We're running. So. This, this analogy can be stretched a little too far, but it does make us stronger. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will get you that. But it, it does put you at a disadvantage, right? And you may not even notice it. Okay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it a little bit further than that. It's not just that we're running with a uh, tailwind, a headwind, but we're also running in the dark. Cool. Okay. Now, the reason I say that is because I have seen it in myself. I've seen it in other people as well. We don't know where we're going to. Yeah. We're usually the first in our groups to be in a particular place. We don't know how to act. Yep. Like I mentioned back when I had my talk with my high school teacher, with my engineering bosses at NASA, how does one react? We don't know. We have no idea how to do this. So we're running and we're running in the dark. So one of my pleas to the community, one of my pleas to you is let's stop running in the dark. Let's at least turn on the lights, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, listen to those who have walked down the path, all right? Karen gave a lovely talk about her experiences. Let's listen to what it meant to have gone through all this stuff. Listen to your mentors and advisors. They know when they can teach you the unwritten rules. Okay, 
I've given a talk called The Unwritten Rules of Hiring or Interviewing, Unwritten Rules of Interviewing. Okay. This talk came about because I had spent probably 10, 15 years as a hiring manager at Sandia Labs. And I would see women and people of color, minorities come in for interviews. And they came in, they interviewed, we went through the whole interview day. At the end of it, they would go back. I would talk to them and they'd say, how, how do you think it went? They go, you know, the interview went well. I really feel good about that. I was sitting on the other side going, oh my God, that was, did not go well at all. But it wasn't their fault. They just didn't know what all of these other unwritten rules were, the things that got people hired. The things that people said, we're never going to hire that person versus, yes, we really want to hire this person over here. Yeah. So I put together a talk about those unwritten rules. Okay. And I gave that talk many, many times. Richard Toppy invited me to give this advice. It's probably had one of the highest uh, attendances ever because people really wanted to know what these unwritten rules were. I hope it helps some students. But the reality is that there's always all these unwritten rules. And unless you've had elders, mentors, uncles, aunts, parents, who can tell you, here's what to expect. Here's how to prepare. Here's how to see what's gonna happen. Here's, here are the kinds of questions you want to ask. You don't know them until it's way too late. So I had the unpleasant duty of calling people up and saying, you didn't get the job. And I would always get the, but I thought I did so well. And it's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> right? Again, it wasn't because they did a bad job. It's just not that they weren't doing what was expected, what people thought they should be following, the rules they should be following. So you really need to develop a network of knowledgeable peers and mentors. All right. So I'll just give you one example of one of my mentors who I think has set the stage. You've probably seen this picture before too. So Richard Tapia. National Medal of Science, National Academy, uh, won every single award that I can think of. Uh, and of course, the Tapia that's named, uh, the Blackwell Tapia Prize is named for, okay? David Blackwell, another fantastic mentor, okay? I've had an incredible amount of luck with mentors. And I just urge all of you to try to find those, those folks, try to go up and talk to them, okay? Students always say, but I don't know what to say. How do, how do I get a conversation going? I said, it's not hard getting us to talk. It's like, Stop. It's hard. <laughs> okay, so, so go up, introduce yourself, talk to them, get some advice. All right. All right. So here's some mentoring tips then. Mentoring, and first and foremost, is your responsibility. Okay. When I was starting to do this, it was like, okay, well, they'll tell me what to do. It's really your responsibility. It's not my responsibility if I want to get a mentor. Okay. It's really something that you need to decide you want to do or not. So I encourage you to do it. Doesn't hurt anything, doesn't cost anything. Know your goals and talk to them, talk them out with someone. Okay. I think one of the things that I wish I had done earlier was knowing or at least talking to people about what my goals were. A lot of times it kind of just went, well, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Okay. Discuss both your strengths, but also your weaknesses. Okay. It's not to say that you'll always have these weaknesses. It just means you can work on those weaknesses. You can work on those areas. Okay. And by doing so, you're going to get to be a better mathematician, a better person. And this is a hard one. Step outside of your comfort zone. That's a hard one. And this is one that it took me a long, long time to really understand, to really internalize. And why? Well, it goes back to the seeds of doubt and the goldfish bowl syndrome. If you step outside your comfort zone, you stand a chance of failing. You stand a chance of losing something. You stand a chance of being embarrassed. Okay. But here's, here's what I are my top three common steps that I make. I sh I'll share them with you. First of all, taking feedback and criticism personally. 
So I did that a lot when I was younger. Actually, it was just last week too. <laughs> <laughs> You know, really, really should try to take criticism, but not, not, not personally. Some people will give you good feedback. The point, though, is also take a look at who's giving you that feedback, right. that criticism. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's some people that when they criticize me, I go, yes, because that's the kind of person that I don't want to be like. Yeah. So when they do that, I go, I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing is avoiding issues until it's too late. So many, many of my students, so many, many of my mentees will come to me with a problem, but it's way too late to do anything about it. Okay, if they had come to me a month earlier or two months earlier, anything can be fixed, anything can be changed. So it's probably not too late, but it's much harder the more you let it go on. Okay, not asking for something in the first place. Okay, let me give you an example of that. I was hiring a faculty member woman faculty member, and I, as a dean, was negotiating the startup packages and, and salary and stuff like that. And so we were going along, and so I said, okay, here's what we can offer. Is that okay? And they went, yeah. And I paused and said, don't you think you should ask for a little bit more? Of <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but you might say no. I said, well, I might say yes. <laughs> So you can't, you have to give us a chance to say yes. Okay, so you have to do that. Now, let me tell you, everybody else is doing it. People will ask, right. all right? So now it all depends on how you ask. Don't, don't be, you know, a jerk about it. <laughs> but, you know, if you ask, sometimes you'll get yes. So go ahead and ask for it. You, know? you guys are all good, strong, very intelligent, smart people. Ask for it. You might get it. Okay, so the second part is failure is a good thing. I gave a talk one time uh, at the Lewis Stokes AMP conference, yeah. Uh, and, and I started out the talk with, I want you to fail. <laughs> Stunned silence from the room. It's <laughs> like, okay, let me explain what I mean by that. <laughs> here's, my, here's what I mean. Failure is a part of doing science. Okay, all of us have done it. If you've done research, you know that you're going to get things wrong, right? If it was something that people had done before, that wouldn't be research. So you're going to fail. So take that to the next level. It is part of doing science. It's part of your career. If you never fail, you're really not going to challenge yourself. And if you're not challenging yourself, you're not going to be a leader. You're not going to get to be the best in what you want to do. And so to take the analogy of the goldfish, sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith. Okay. Sometimes you make it, sometimes you end up on poor. That's okay, right? You've got to try, you've got to take that chance. That is probably, you know, somebody asked Karen something they wish they'd done earlier, something they've changed. I would probably take more chances earlier on, okay? Again, for me, it always felt like that was going to be the death of me. But, you know, you can always recover from mistakes. All right. Talking about the changing landscape, it doesn't seem like things are changing. On a more positive note, I think they are changing slowly, very slowly. So the one thing I tell my kids, you just have to have patience. You have to have stamina. You're going to have to persevere. You have to be persistent. I hope that we're persistent as a community. I hope that we do things and we see them that they are better than they were 40 years ago. But the other thing is, I also see a large movement against what we're doing. Take a look at the country right now. There's a lot of pushback. And I say to everybody, we're not going to go back to the way we were. We're not going to give up the gains we made. We're going to fight for them. There really are no timeouts. <laughs> And there's a long time between halves. So I say this because as a soccer coach for my kids, I would always tell them this. Okay, the game you're playing, you just can't pull out all of a sudden and say, hey, I'm quitting right now. You've got to go the long, long way. But finally, also have fun. Okay. It can't be all dreary stuff. You can't just do it because your parents want you to do it. <laughs> uh, and you have to have passion for your work. 
So again, my daughter, and I, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, never grow up. Uh, Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I think that I've, I've done well, and that is, well, I shouldn't say well, I've done better in the last 10 or so, 15 years, so, is work on that balance. I've seen way too many of my friends, way too many of my colleagues who've had to face all the things that we've had to face, and they haven't ended in a good place. So if you can, make sure that you strike that balance. It's not all about the work. You want to have, you want to have a life as well. All right, so here's, here's some final thoughts then to leave you with. Here's some ideas for turning on the lights. As I mentioned again, I want to emphasize the, the role of role models is important. So seek out those mentors and champions. And I make a distinction between mentors and champions because mentors will help you out. Champions will actively make sure that you get noticed, that they have opportunities for you. They tell you about new things that you can do and they, they will champion you to other people, hiring committees, things like that. Build a network of colleagues. This is something that I don't think we do well enough, to be honest. We do not have a strong enough network to really help each other out. Take risks. I've already mentioned that. Failure is okay. Always do your best, but always have fun. So here's one thing that I am very proud of. There is this wall at Rice University. And in there, they have the uh, alum of the year. Okay. And Rice has been around for a long time. So it's a big wall. And there's full of pictures that look like this. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I got nominated and I received the Alumni of the Year Award. Outstanding Engineering Alumnus, Juan Mesa. I'm the only one there like that. <laughs> so now, all the other people that have to walk past the wall have to take a look at the picture. <laughs> More importantly, I think the students at least see that, hey, existence proof. That's an existence proof. But I won't take all that credit. I couldn't have done it by myself. I had a lot of help. There's Richard Tapia, who helped me out. And I couldn't have done it without him. So let me, final, final thought. I love this quote by President Obama back in 2009. I'll just read it very quickly for you. We will build the roads and bridges, the electric grids and digital lines that feed our commerce and bind us together. Okay, this is my emphasis here. We'll restore science to its rightful place and wheel technologies wonders to raise healthcare's quality and lower its cost. We'll harness the sun and the winds and the soil to fuel our cars and run our factories. And we will transfer form our schools and colleges and universities. Universities to meet the demands of a new age. Good thoughts, but let me add this part to it. Can we restore science to its rightful place without ourselves, all of you guys, all of us, first taking our rightful place within science? So I leave you with a challenge. It's your turn now. All right, so thank you very much. I'll see you by the ocean. <laughs>
Amos Rad, by the way, just got one of those legendary uh, presidential awards for excellent science, mathematics, and engineering mentoring. And I'll tell you an inside secret. The difference, they, that was the second time they applied. <laughs> okay. The first time uh, was, you know, they said close but no cigar, right? Uh, the second time, what made the difference was the statistics that they could put up that came out of MSRI. And that was absolutely the difference. That so is a fantastic we'll, program, by the way. What's that? <laughs> that is a fantastic program, by the way. Yes. It is a fabulous program. And you've been a mentor in it. You know, I've heard from some of your students in it. So it's just, what is the feeling like when this happens? So I went to that, I went to that, well, uh, the students poster presentation. And I would first talk about their science with them, okay, about their mathematics. And then I would say, so what did you like about the program? And they would say, well, I, you know, it's good mathematics and so forth, but they gave absolutely glowing, just uniformly glowing comments about the mentorship that they were getting. And they said, you know, from the time I got there, I felt like I belonged in this profession. I would urge you, so there is a question here. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, I, I would urge you at the next JMM, uh, that you go take a look at what those kids are doing and how they're coming out of it changed, really changed. So my question is, how does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> how, how does what feel? Being a mentor there. Oh, knowing, oh. That that's, knowing, knowing that this has happened. Well, it, it gives you, I mean, it's, it's hard to describe the feeling because, you know, it's, you're yeah. at, the, at, the, at the MSRI up. And so it's kind of like a normal class at the beginning. But then the more you work with the students, but even more so, the more you see them after they get through with the program. Mm -hmm. So do you remember Gina Maria? I was going to mention Gina. Okay. Yeah, because so, I've heard from Gina. Okay, so, so I still hear from Gina. In fact, I heard from her like about three or four days ago. Yeah. So Gina was one of the students in the very first MSRI program. So I, I think I, I think I ran the very first one, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think you, I think you did. Yeah. And Gina was one of the students there. And so she came out of, New Jersey Institute of Technology? Mm, yeah, so I think it's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and she had, no, no I'm not going to say that. You may not want me to say that. Yeah. She was one of the uh, students who went through the program, and it is a very tough program because mm -hmm. we, we really put them through the, the ringer. But when she came out of that, she was like, had completely transformed from somebody who thought she might want to do math to somebody who really wanted to do math, but more so, she had the confidence that she didn't have before. She's got a PhD in uh, statistics, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. She's now at uh, University of North Carolina or North Carolina State. Might be Duke. One of the universities. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's UNC, Chapel Hill. Uh, yeah, but right. uh, she is an amazing, an amazing woman. And I think she just, uh, it, she's a great mentor on her own, by the way. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's whenever I talk to Richard, I, you know, I, I always make it a point to, to let him know all the things that he's done for me. And we always talk about this and we both believe the same thing. You don't pay it back to the mentor, you pay it forward. Pay it forward. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last 40 some odd years. And that's what the students that go through that say that they're interested in doing too. Uh, you hear that a lot, that they say, you know, this has been a wonderful experience for me and I want to give somebody else that experience too. So. Like like you said, go do this, please. And now I'll shut up and let you ask some questions. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm interested in hearing from your perspective as a former dean. Um, so I feel like we learn a lot about like academic paths, just like becoming research mathematicians and going down tenure track. But I feel like when you mentioned leadership, that really stuck out to me because I feel like we never really see that jump from like being professional working mathematicians to like university administration level. Do you feel like that's something that we need to like have as a potential goal for ourselves or how do you feel that? I, that's a fantastic question. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt a little bit because it's so personal to everybody. I think, yes, it can be a goal. I think you need to be aware of what you're gonna get yourself into. I was, basically asked to be a manager half a dozen times before I finally stepped up to be a manager at Sandia Labs. Um, and how much time do I have? Uh, <laughs> theoretically, I think. 
about three minutes. <laughs> but three minutes? Okay, so I won't tell the story, but maybe I'll tell it over lunch. Um, one of the things that you had to, one of the things that made me want to be a manager is that you could do so much more than you can do as a professional mathematician or as a PI, if you will. But the downside is that you have to put up with a lot of other stuff. <laughs> it is wonderful that I'm right now, I'm just a plain old professor, which I love. I get to sit in my office, I get to think math, I get to teach all the good stuff. As an administrator, you have the ability to do, to basically amplify everything that you wanted to do. But there's a lot of constraints on your time as well. So you have to think about it. You should talk to a lot of people about how to do it or not. But, but I'll give you one short story then. When I was at NSF and I walked in to the Division of Mathematical Science, we had 24, 22, 24, 24, let's say 24. Uh, program officers. Okay, as Bob said, these are the people that hand out money. I sign off on them, but they make the decisions. Okay, on funding at every level of mathematics research in the country. So out of those twenty-four, three were women. Okay. Three were women. So one of the things that I said was, "Is we need to change this. We need to make a difference." Only got three years. Well. I actually only had two years, but then they gave me a third year and they gave me a fourth year. But so in four years, we went from three to half and half. In fact, I think it was 13 uh, women program officers. Okay, that's the kind of difference you can make. Okay, I'm not saying I did it by myself, <coughs> by no means. We had a ton of, I had a ton of help from the program officers that were there because they saw that as a opportunity as well. I had support from my, and or my supervisors as well. And most of all, the community stepped up. When we said we were going to do this and they saw that we were serious about this, more and more people started to apply. So we went from three to, like I said, half and half. So if you take a look at the roster right now, it is half and half. That was not by accident. It takes a team to do it though. Again, it wasn't just me, but I pushed hard on it. And that's the kind of stuff you can do. That's the kind of change you can make. But you do have to put up with certain things for sure. I, did I answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, good. We have time for maybe one more quick question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, my question is um, recently from the dean's office or from the provost, we are seeing this new kind of quote unquote diversity bias or diversity initiative where, of course, the minorities are the target which is a great opportunity for diversity, but has been deficient there. You know, as you mentioned, since if you are hired as a diversity hire, kind of all the lens of the camera turns on to you and your success or failure, that already on top of the natural imposter syndrome from PhD would put extra weight to success. And even though you know you are there deep down from your credibility, you still feel isolated. How do you give advice to such people in this situation, how to navigate such pressure? I would say, and regardless of the outcome, what should they feel about themselves? Great question. And you know, I, I'm sorry that we have to ask this question now and because it's the same question we were asking ourselves 40 years ago, right? But here's what I would say to you and to anybody else. Okay, yes, it looks like a diversity hire. Okay, that door is still open. Walk in it, prove them wrong. Make sure that they understand that, you know, whatever that, that uh, moniker was, whatever that title was, you were there because you deserve to be there. Okay, that's what I did to a certain extent. There's always that stigma, but you know what? Doesn't matter 10 years later. Once you get tenure, how you got there. The fact is you are there and you can make a difference. Your students will know you, they will come to you, they will see you, and they're not gonna remember how you got there. But it is important that you're there. That's, that's the important part. But to your other question about how do you handle it, that goes back to the network. Talk, talk to other people about how they handle it because we've all, 
all face that situation. And we can all tell you stories and I could go on for another two hours with stories, <laughs> but we have time and I'm keeping you between, I'm not between you and lunch, so. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a terrific presentation. Absolutely.